China, a country the size of Europe, with every kind of landscape. every kind of habitat, every kind of climate, and where animals of many different types rare, exquisite, and endangered live in unique ecosystems in remote isolation and alongside people. But today, both these habitats and the extraordinary species who live within them are increasingly faced with challenges. as people race to find solutions. To preserve China's wild beauty. the fabled grasslands of China. They carpet over a third of the country, with four million square kilometers of rolling prairie. Grasslands are so varied, you find them at contrasting altitudes and climates. Four thousand meters up on the Tibetan plateau, Himalayan peaks overshadow fertile alpine pastures. In China's low-lying Great West, grasslands gradually give way to sand. In the north are the lush meadows and wetlands of Inner Mongolia. Each grassland has a nature that's diverse and distinct. But where the dramas of life, death and survival play out each day and in every season. This is an ecosystem where wildlife shares its home with humans, nomads and farmers and where the very grasslands that they all depend upon are now under threat. Springtime in eastern Inner Mongolia. The snows have melted and the new grass is beginning to grow. A flock of demoiselle cranes are returning to their northern breeding ground. These demoiselle cranes have endured one of the toughest migrations on Earth. They've flown 8,000 kilometers from India. They've crossed the mighty Himalayas and the high Tibetan plateau, heading for these northern prairies. Having fended off hunger and attack from golden eagles, Their journey is complete. And 
finally, they land here, on the Xilinguala grasslands of Inner Mongolia. Every year, they return with just one purpose, to breed. Demoiselle cranes are one of the smallest crane species. Their black head sports two white stripes made up of longer plumes and a grey beak with an orange tip. The cranes arrive in large flocks, but as soon as they touch down, they disperse quickly into couples and the males begin showing aggressive and territorial behaviour to those who were previously their flying companions. This male and female are monogamous and will stay together for life. This couple quickly get on with the matter of looking for a suitable place to lay eggs. Their beady red eyes seeking out the perfect spot. She can lay eggs every spring and here, directly onto the ground, she lays two. She positions them in an exposed patch of short grass and under the full glare of the morning sunshine hopeful that at least one of her two embryos will survive. And now she waits. It will be 30 days before their chicks hatch. But there's one big disadvantage to laying eggs directly on the ground. They make easy pickings for predators. The cranes keep watch 24 hours a day for 30 long days. While the female sits on her eggs, the male chooses a vantage point to keep watch. As the fox gets closer, the birds alert each other to the danger with sharp warning cries. This time, they're lucky, and the fox moves off. He's set his sights on easier prey, a lone piker. He sets an ambush, lying low to conceal himself within the long grass. Defenceless and alone, the prey is helpless. And this solitary hunter's victorious return is greeted with excitement back at his den. The demoiselle crane is free once more to tend her eggs, turning them to ensure that each side gets equally warmed under the golden sunshine. The egg's colour will darken as the day of the chick's hatching gets closer. When it's chilly, she keeps them warm under her wings for a day or two. When night falls, they take turns to sit on their offspring, brooding. A constant temperature is needed for the embryos to develop, and both the male and female incubate their eggs. Trading places every two hours, through good weather and bad. As our crane couple devotedly protect their eggs in Inner Mongolia, three and a half thousand kilometers southwest, spring comes to these highland prairies a little later in the year. This is the Tibetan Plateau, also grassland. But unlike the home of the cranes, this high-altitude grassland is 4,000 metres up and much colder.
Every season is harsh, with frequent strong winds. Humans move across this area with their flocks of sheep. And yaks. They share the plateau with wildlife of all kinds. All have developed in their different ways to life on these very high grasslands, even thriving. Yaks have been living here for hundreds of thousands of years, since the species separated from lowland cattle. These half-ton beasts have adapted to this tough environment. Wild yaks share their physiological adaptation to the cold and altitude with their domestic cousins. In winter here, temperatures drop to minus 40 degrees Celsius and yaks can lose up to 30% of their body weight. A thick coat insulates them from the cold. But their real evolutionary genius lies beneath the wool with their organs. They have extra large lungs that have evolved over millennia to capture as much oxygen as possible at this high altitude, where the air contains less oxygen than at sea level. and their very large hearts increase the volume and rate at which the oxygenated blood can be pumped around their bodies. It's an April morning. A manual couple emerge from the rocks they live in. They have the thickest fur of all cats. which serves as good protection from frostbite in this extreme landscape. And their short limbs and especially small ears combat the high winds that frequently whip this prairie. The familiar grassland chorus has awoken some Tibetan fox cub siblings, emerging from their home for the first time. They're now about four weeks old and have spent the first month of their lives in their underground den, being suckled by their mother. And so now they're finally ready to see what the grasslands have to offer. And are taking the opportunity to explore while their mother, the vixen, is hunting. But they are unaccustomed to life on the outside and for now too cautious to wander far from the entrance to their den. This cub will be entirely dependent on his mother for the first 10 months of his life. He retreats back to wait for her return with breakfast. Piker emerges from his burrow. Small and seemingly insignificant, these mammals, most closely related to the rabbit, help maintain the whole ecosystem high up on this prairie. It rarely rains on the Tibetan plateau, but when it does, the rains are fierce and heavy. In such dry, cold terrain, flash floods could devastate the environment sliding over the impervious land without any absorption. But the millions of pika who live here have created an underground network of burrows that effectively act as sponges, absorbing the water. Despite holding together the very ecology of the plateau, life for the pika on the grasslands is treacherous. They're near the very bottom of the food chain.
and as the main source of food for multiple predators, their round bodies look like a tempting treat. With the females giving birth to up to 13 young, sometimes five times a year, there are more than enough to feed the demand. These pikers' play fight attracts attention. Two step eagles take flight. circle threateningly overhead. They use minimal wing flapping, instead riding on thermals and updrafts created by the landscape. Their young, just days old, wait with anticipation back in their nest. Usually for the first two weeks, only the father hunts, but these chicks are hungry, feeding around every couple of hours, so both parents are out scouring the grasslands below. And they're ready to dive at speeds of up to 200 kilometers an hour if they spot a catch. But the mother won't stay away from her nest for long as her bright white eaglets are now exposed to their own predators. Other raptors intent on feeding their own precious young. They will stay in this nest for 60 days. And over the course of three months, will grow the feathers needed for flight, 7,000 of them, slowly transforming their bodies from white down to the light brown of their parents. Their feathers, talons, and beak will grow throughout their entire life. Their mother hasn't managed to catch anything or find any carcass and returns to the nest empty-handed. But she's got another important job to do. The sun has nearly reached its height and could harm her young chicks. So she makes a shade out of her broad wings. The female step eagle is larger than her mate with a two meter wide wingspan ample space for her chicks. Her layers of feathers can also trap air to insulate the chicks against the cold wind. To keep up its strength and to stay warm and protected in low temperatures, this piker will eat 50% of its body weight in food each day. He even eats his faecal matter storing it in his burrows, a second chance to absorb the nutrients. But such constant consumption means exposing himself to dangers while foraging. This ambitious fox cub spots something rustling and is drawn out by curiosity. Pika employ lookouts to ensure good odds for survival. The lookout sends a warning signal, a distinct high-pitched cry that says danger is imminent. He is one of several pikers positioned on raised mounds, keeping watch over the wide expanse of grasslands while their friends risk their lives to collect food. Never straying more than 20 metres from his burrow, the race is on to get underground.
and this time he makes it back safely and hurries to the depth of his burrow so as to avoid the digging claws of the desperate fox. A single interconnected burrow can have five access holes. So the pika are able to escape predators against the odds. While one cub practices hunting, without success this time, one of his brothers explores another intriguing find, common on the plateau, yak dung. Miraculously, despite living under the threat of danger all around, this pika has a life expectancy of seven years. In part, due to an unlikely partnership. While the pika's enemies are numerous, it has found an ally in the snowfinch. a non-migratory high-altitude bird with an elaborate mating dance that resembles a display fight. The male and female circle around each other, popping with slow fluttering wings. The male leads with the female mimicking his every move. Mating partners are decided upon based on this dance. And another male contender steps up. This ritual takes place between May and August after which the female lays up to five eggs. But the permafrost on the plateau means that there are no trees for them to make nests in. And unable to fly more than 10 metres, their options are limited. Birds lay eggs in nests to isolate them and the hatched fledglings from ground-level predators. But as snow finches can't build nests in trees, they found a smart solution. Go underground. They make their nests and lay their eggs among the pika in their underground burrows. It's a system that suits them both. The snowfinches get a safe place for their chicks, and the pika get more sets of eyes on the lookout for predators. For the snowfinches share many enemies with the pika. Predators intent on taking eggs from their underground nests. The pika has evaded fox and buzzard. But her success is another's loss.
buzzards here have found a different solution to the lack of trees for their nests. They lay their eggs and raise their young in crevices high on cliff faces. An upland buzzard returns from hunting, clasping food in her talons. Not a pika this time, but a rodent. And then heads straight back out hunting. Her strongest devours the rat in one go. while her youngest is still waiting for its turn. The mother can store food for several hours in her enlarged esophagus, known as a crop. After hatching, the young are unable to fly for the first two months of life and stay in the nest, a substantial one metre diameter structure of branches and twigs lined with vegetation that their mother adds to every day until the chicks leave the nest. She's also used man-made materials, like plastic and cotton rags that she's found, to build her nest. While the mother is out hunting, her chicks undertake the essential first step in learning to fly. They already have most of their flight feathers, with just some soft down remaining, and are soon due to fly the nest at 45 days old. They practice the art of balance. Their feathers are lined for flight as gusts of wind catch under their wings. They only get one chance at their first flight, which will have to wait for a few more weeks. And until then, they are dependent on their mother and happy to have their food delivered. Wildlife and domesticated herds live side by side up here on the high grasslands. Even though it's spring, a sudden drop in temperature is making life even tougher for everyone. For pika, and for the herders who have for centuries wandered this land, searching for the finest grass to graze their flocks on. The air in this region is always in motion. Snow can cover the plateau here for seven months of the year, and this snowfall is beginning to settle. As temperatures plummet, a nomad races against the clock to ensure her flock have enough food throughout the cold spell. Lodan is a nomadic herder. Famed for producing the best sheep in China. She herds Tibetan sheep, a hardy breed that can endure the bad weather. She rears them for their meat, but also for their wool. It's the lambing season, and Lodan can't let these late snows affect her animals' well-being.
She covers the ground with grass to prevent a frost and ensure some food for her flock. As the snow persists, the first lambs are being born at sub-zero temperatures. But Tibetan sheep are tough, and combined with the nomads' expertise in caring for them and rearing them, most will survive to taste their first bites of grass. Early summer on the grasslands of Inner Mongolia is a far more hospitable environment. The pair of demoiselle cranes have tirelessly cared for their eggs, and now, after 30 long days, protecting and warming them, something has changed. The female calls to her partner, not with an alarm cry, but one that suggests excitement. All of their efforts have now paid off. The shell cracks and her first chick begins to hatch, pecking its way out using its egg tooth, a small, sharp protrusion on the tip of its beak that will fall off after birth. The first infant crane, or colt, prizes itself out of the egg. And later, its sibling arrives too. Once they've acclimatized to life on the outside, their training begins. In three months, they will migrate south for the winter. And before then, they need to acquire many skills. But for now, they practice the basics, like walking and running. Cranes typically run into the wind to achieve the lift necessary for flight. It will be two months before their wing feathers are developed enough to take off. So until then, they're firmly rooted to the ground. Infant cranes, colts, aren't born with distinctively long legs. These come with age. So keeping up with their parents is a tiring business. This morning, they're looking for food. Their beaks have evolved to be long enough to dig out worms from below the surface, down amongst the tough roots of the grass. A bit of competition is needed to get the colts moving. Who can get the worm first? She feeds them directly from her beak to theirs. Sibling rivalry can be a great motivator. Demoiselle cranes eat a varied diet, from small rodents and amphibians to insects and plants. 
they're opportunistic feeders and change their diet according to the season and their own nutritional needs. The fledglings can now flaunt their long necks, varying the sound of the cries they make and increasing their communication skills by lengthening and positioning their trachea. They occasionally flutter their wings, now coated in a soft down. They're yet to develop the feathers needed for flight. When the summer ends, they will embark on an epic journey south to India. A 5,000 kilometer long migration to warmer winter weather. This will be the last journey the colts will make with their parents. Once they reach India, the family will separate. The parents will stick together. But the colts will be on their own. And will have to fend for themselves. So for now, they all enjoy a little family time. As the day draws to a close, the mother lovingly tucks her chicks under her wings. It's high summer on the grasslands of central Mongolia, and temperatures soar well into the 30s. Here in the Hunshandaka Desert, the rising of the Gauga Sertai River has created a unique and magical habitat. An oasis of shimmering blue and green surrounded by the yellow brown of the sand. Local people have come to call it the Desert Garden. This unique area with deep pools of water is rich in wading bird life. Statue-like herons loom above the water, waiting to pounce on a passing fish. White spoonbills patrol the shores. They feed with elegant sideward sweeps. crushing crustaceans in their powerful bills. A black-winged stilt creeps about in the shallow water. This one's red legs show that it has reached maturity. In recent years, the number of birds in the desert garden has increased dramatically. But the reason for this sudden increase in bird numbers is sinister. Ten kilometers away is Major Chaganor. Once there was a lake here with a diverse ecosystem, but now, after years of drought and water evaporation, all that remains is the white expanse of the salt flats. The wading birds may have found water elsewhere and fled to the desert garden and other regions of Inner Mongolia's grasslands. But for the nomads who call this region home, the disappearance of the lake is a major problem.
Narangawan's 300-strong flock needs water and a prairie to graze on. Both now are in very short supply. But even more worryingly, the grass in this grassland is struggling to survive. And without its long sheaves of grass acting as a barrier to wind-blown sand, what is left of this grassland is being consumed by desert. Finding a meadow to pitch a yurt and feed the flock is becoming very hard. And so these herders are taking action. They're trying to reverse the desertification that they see all around them to save their traditions and livestock. The natural order dictates that as the survival of some creatures is threatened by changing habitat and they're pushed out or die off, others step in and thrive. With the emergence of this hostile environment, the desert lizard is king. Its densely overlapping scales reduce water evaporation air flows through its lungs in just one direction, most efficiently extracting oxygen from the air. And the desert lizard can also adapt its colour to become lighter as temperatures rise. It reflects more sunlight and so keeps it cooler. This amphibian is relishing the changing landscape and is fast colonising this desert breeding at a great rate. But if Naren is successful, this failing grassland will not turn entirely to desert. The salt flats will transform to provide the nomads with the green meadows they rely upon for their livelihoods. and they believe the solution to their problems are these. Plants native to coastal marshes, able to survive even in the most extreme environments, capable of growing even on these salt flats and in the desert, where there is little moisture in the soil. Every year, between spring and summer, they plant thousands of seeds across former grassland. And their efforts are beginning to bear fruit. Last summer, this field was barren. Through transplanting non-native plants to this land, the inhabitants can now imagine a future. With the very food that their sheep eat also acting as a barrier to sand blowing down from the desert. China's grasslands, 
and the rich variety of chicks born into this vast ecosystem are now fledged. The young buzzards on the Tibetan plateau strut on their grasslands. Their white markings and feather tips are a reminder that they are still young. Now able to extend their wings two meters wide as they take up their position in the sky. In Inner Mongolia, the Demazel crane colts are now fully fledged. Soon they will embark on their mighty five week flight to India. Migration brings out the sociable side of the crane. And the solitary family of four joins up with other families until a group of 200 or more has been formed. And it's finally time to bid farewell to the plains where they were hatched and raised. They test the air currents and wind direction. They wait for the sun to be in the right position. They watch for the all clear. And they are off. Flying in a V formation, they will take turns to lead the flock. As this is their first flight, on this journey, the young cranes will not take a turn at the helm. Their parents will. Using their inbuilt navigation system and knowledge of the rivers and valleys below, they fly at an altitude of up to 8,000 meters as they pass over mountain ranges. Each bird positioning itself on the wingtip of another to reduce the headwind. They fly as all cranes do, with their necks and legs extended in a perfect straight line, matching the rhythm of their wing beats to perfectly benefit from one another's updraft. the grasslands. An area of China as varied in landscapes as it is in species. Everyone dependent on the grass for food, cover and livelihood. some permanent inhabitants, others seasonal visitors. Where the smallest creatures maintain the ecosystem, and the largest beasts adapt to the harsh climate, A land of stunning beauty, ever-changing. From season to season, and stretching unbroken to the horizon.